All right, hello there. It's Tuesday, July 28th, the year 2015, and it's 1 o'clock Eastern, and this is Advancement Live. Yes, you are on the right channel. I am a fill-in host today, Keith Hannon, Associate Director of Social Media Strategy at Cornell University's Alumni Affairs and Development. And Advancement Live, just to give you some quick background, should you be new to the format, Advancement Live is part of the Higher Ed Live network, offering viewers direct access to the best and brightest minds in education. Live webcasts allow viewers to share knowledge and participate in discussions around the most important issues in the industry. Emphasis on participate. We hope you'll join us via the Higher Ed Live hashtag today. All episodes of Advancement Live are free and accessible in the video archives at higheredlive.com and in podcast form on iTunes. Advancement Live is made possible by iModules, the leading constituent engagement management provider for educational institutions, and they're also hosting their Sizzle 15 conference right now, so follow that hashtag for some insights and fun. iModules delivers an integrated online platform, transforming how institutions strengthen constituent relationships and achieve fundraising success. Higher Ed Live is produced by M. Stoner, a marketing and communications firm that works with education institutions on branding, strategy, web design, and more. Join M. Stoner on August 12th for their latest webinar, A Tale of Two Ink Densities, Understanding the Details of the Print Process. If you're making a communication professional responsible for creating or influencing print communications, you won't want to miss this session. We're tweeting out a link where you can learn more and register. And with that, welcome to this exciting episode of Advancement Live, where today's topic is Social Media 101 for Gift Officers. With me are two uh, esteemed guests who have I had the pleasure of knowing for uh, some time now. Uh, first, we have Jim Zimmerman, the Chief evangelist for Evertrue and a savvy and wise sage who has three decades of experience in advancement and fundraising. Jim, welcome to the show. How is San Diego treating us today? Good morning, Keith. Uh, San Diego, uh, pretty consistently 75 degrees. Um, another, another consistent day, so things are great here on the left coast. That is a shame, isn't it? Consistently <laughs> 75. Uh, our other guest, uh, Mike O'Neill from Ithaca College, uh, cannot say the same about where he resides. Mike and I share a town of Ithaca, New York. And Mike, uh, tell us a little bit about, uh, well, not the weather here in Ithaca because it's never <laughs> it's worth really talking about, but... Right. Uh, <laughs> You're a, you're a returning champion in my world. I, I seem to feature you in pretty much uh, everything I do. So tell us a little bit about who you are and what you're doing. Well, um, I uh, started in um, advancement um, in alumni relations at RPI and um, I worked there for almost mm -hmm. nine years and then moved into um, the social media strategist position that I'm in right now at Ithaca College. So um, I have an, um, a quite a mix of, of backgrounds in um, both advancements and overall uh, college communications. So, and we're just, uh, my department just moved into the um, Institutional Advancement Division here at IC. So, kind of coming back full circle and um, helping out um, to kind of form the strategy for the communications around um, you know, IA as, uh, as, we, as we move forward. Great, and you're also uh, focusing on camera issues today on your laptop, so you can't see Mike, but you can hear him, and that's really the important thing. Is, is <laughs> Which is the hearing, best way to... Hearing Mike's knowledge bombs is, is much more <laughs> important, and he is an Ithaca College bomber, so that makes sense. Uh, Jim, I introduced you in your title, but let's, let's talk a little bit about your background. Give us the kind of the elevator pitch for, for your experience and what you're doing now. Sure. Uh, thanks. I uh, am, a, am a Bucknell University alum. Uh, got my career start in advancement uh, as the low man on the Bucknell annual giving totem pole and, uh, and then spent the next 30 years uh, working as a 
a frontline fundraiser, chief advancement officer uh, in the in independent school world, um, series of, of uh, the Lawrenceville School in New Jersey, the Kate School in California, uh, almost 20 years at Middlesex School in Boston, and then a couple years uh, at the Francis Parker School in San Diego. Uh, really uh, uh, spent a lot of, of the last decade of my career really, um, I'll, I'll say, sort of out at the forefront of, of engaging alums and uh, on social media, uh, was Evertrue's first customer and a couple years ago uh, made the move from advancement to working with, uh, with Evertrue as we seek to really help schools understand their data uh, and, and access intelligence uh, through social media and, and professional media like LinkedIn to really understand um, you know, where their alumni are today. So it's been a really interesting kind of 360 degree uh, view of, I should say I was also president of the Bucknell Alumni Association and a trustee at Bucknell and so saw the, uh, the advancement side from that angle as well. So interesting perspective. Not only the president, also a client. Exactly, exactly. For those of you too young to get that reference, we'll, <laughs> we'll follow up on Twitter. Um, all right. Well, gentlemen, thank you for, for joining me for this episode of Advancement Live. And the topic we're tackling today is something both of you are, are very familiar with, and it's the idea of, at the very least, introducing, if not strategizing, social media with gift officers. I think this is a very touchy topic perhaps at times. Uh, certainly we know that a lot of gift officers have been in their role for a very long time. They have a way of doing things. They have a Rolodex. They have a spreadsheet. Uh, not to stereotype, but certainly uh, there is a way to accomplish things, uh, a method to their madness. And for the majority of their career, social media has probably not been a part of that. And so I think there can be a fair amount of skepticism uh, when it comes to these types of platforms serving uh, as an aid to fundraising and prospect discovery and management. Uh, so Jim, let's start with you and then, and then Mike, you can chime in. Uh, how would you describe the current relationship between gift officers and social media? And how, how do you think they respond to the notion of using it for cultivation, stewardship, maybe if they're really crazy, solicitation? I think the I think the the status there really is dependent on the gift officer. Um, you know, I, I know a number of people who are are pretty active in using it as a one-off means of understanding uh, understanding who they're speaking to. You know, certainly they'll they'll take a quick look at uh, the LinkedIn profile, uh, maybe look at the individual's Facebook page or try to find them on. Twitter to understand a little bit about them, um, but but not in any uh, any sort of broad way, uh, and it certainly isn't across the uh, across the spectrum. I think you're right. I think there are a number of of uh, gift officers, really, and it's not age based. It's just a sort of on personality basis where uh, understanding social and professional uh, information is is not central to what they're doing. Um, and I think there's often a, a lack of a, of a connection between the, the social media that the institution is posting and the priorities of the institution as those gift officers are, are trying to find those matches. And do you think they, how would you gauge their current level of receptiveness to, if, if you were to go into their office and say, I want you to start doing this, what do you think their reaction would be? I think there's I think there's uh, intrigue, but suspicion of, of okay. where you know how much value there is uh, in understanding how someone's engaging on social media. I think I think the widespread acceptance that there's value in understanding the LinkedIn sort of professional information. I think other forms of social media um, maybe a little more cautious in terms of understanding or anticipating where their where the value might be. Mm -hmm. Great, okay. Mike. Uh, can you can you serenade us with your experience with regards to? Uh, I know I know you did some work in this realm when you were uh, up in the capital region at RPI. Yeah, I, I would kind of agree with, um, with you know some of that as well. That, that 
Um, I think it really depends on the person, clearly. You know, some people are more, just more um, comfortable with social media in general and um, understand some of the, the uses a little bit better. So they have, you know, you'll, you'll see an advancement officer or a uh, giving officer um, who uses Twitter quite a bit and, and follows their uh, prospects um, and uses it in that regard. But I think overall there's still th – there's a more openness now um, – from what I've seen, that uh, people are that uh, gift officers are more willing to, um, you know, see what we can do with social. But I think there's still the uh, feeling of kind of falling back on what has been done in the previously and what they're used to um, in order to communicate and um, kind of follow the the um, the things that that they're uh, prospects think are important. So I, I definitely think that there's some room to grow there. Um, and I, I definitely think that if we can find ways to show that importance and to show um, how it can be used, um, it opens up uh, possibilities and, and opens up minds quite a bit. And it's something that I tried to do at RPI um, while I was there. Yeah, and I think it also frequently comes down to sort of tangible antidotes. Uh, right. You know, I know here at, at Cornell, I have talked to one gift officer who says one of her prospects won't return calls, won't return emails, but will always respond to direct messages on LinkedIn. And another gift officer has actually followed and following uh, some of her prospects on Instagram. So it's, it's interesting to see this stuff kind of unfold. And I think and sharing those examples, especially if, if you know peer institutions are doing things like that, that might get people on board more. Uh, yeah. Both of, both of you have been been around uh, advancement for for a while. Mike, you not as long as Jim, but really nobody as long as Jim, to be fair. <laughs> <laughs> um, and over the years, you know, various uh, various technologies uh, have at least, if not accomplished this, at least attempted to disrupt. Uh, higher ed communications. Uh, so has there been anything you've witnessed in the past to kind of use as an example of, you know, there was a time where we didn't think X was uh, going to be a useful tool. It turns out that now we use it every day. Uh, something like that to kind of make us feel optimistic that it's just a matter of time before social has to be embraced in this regard. Well, I mean, the Internet, right? I mean, who That's a big one. People didn't think that really, like the internet would be um, used all that much. And I, I guess in some ways, the email as well. When that first came out, people didn't think it would be used that that much. And all, all of a sudden, like where would we where, where would we be without either one of those two things? So, um, I definitely think that um, we're already starting to um, see that. Um, social media is just another tool, um, just like the phone, just like the computer, um, just like an in-person visit um, in many ways. So um, I think it's just a matter of time of, of whether, when people start to use it more um, and see the, 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 um, the value behind um, some of the different platforms and what each of them can do. Yeah, I would I would agree, I th and I think um, you know I'm I'm old enough to remember the first online gift uh, we ever received. Um, People will so, never put in their credit card information. No, ever they will never ever put their credit card information onto a onto a form on the computer. Um, and you know I don't know what the percentage is now, but I'm I'm sure online giving has surpassed uh, direct mail giving, and uh, you know there there are just so many hundreds of millions of our alumni who are on these social platforms and some use it more than others and some are passive and some are active but um, our alumni are there uh, they our younger alumni might be shifting to uh, snapchat from Facebook or, or whatever but but they're on social media and and we need to find them where they are yeah I think that's that's a pretty good point it's just this idea that communications technologies, which, whichever is the more recent one, is not the one that's really worth our time. You know, it's always, it's always the ones we've been using for many decades. Uh, and I think eventually that's, that's going to change. Uh, 
Let me ask you this, uh, and we, Jim, you can start with this one. Uh, is there a case that social media shouldn't be used in the day-to-day -day work of a, of a gift officer or, or in a major gifts program? Well, I think, I, uh, I think the, the way I would answer that is um, that, you know, for some of our alums, and, and certainly not all of our older alumni, but, uh, you know, for a, a large percentage of our oldest alumni who are not active on social media, uh, you know, we need, to, we need to not overplay that hand and, and make assumptions that all of our constituents are, are active on there and, and forget other methods of, of engagement. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think as, as, as broadly as we can begin to engage the alumni who are there, on it, I think they would value it. Yeah, and, and if I can just jump into that, I also I think that um, as a case-by-case -case basis in terms of the different platforms for social media, some definitely shouldn't. Keith, you and I kind of talked about this over Twitter um, a while ago about how, you know, um, Twitter itself um, can be a good tool for um, giving officers to connect with their um, prospects because it's it's kind of like you know meeting them at, at their favorite coffee shop, whereas right. you wouldn't connect with them on Facebook because that's like going into their home um, and like you're barging into their home and it's just not something that anybody would would actually do. So um, I think in some respects it it depends on the social platform. Um, that you want to try to connect with them. So there are some cases, I think, when social um, shouldn't be used, but it's more, I think, the platform. Um, but also, you know, not everything um, is a fix for, you know, not everybody wants to be engaged on, on one certain platform, so. Yeah, uh, I think I, I, the way I look at it frequently is, to me, it feels like social media is in desperate need of a marketing or public relations makeover uh, because you have to look at it from the perspective of the gift officers who probably aren't using social media other than for personal reasons and the way people use social media for personal reasons is very different than how people like ourselves use it but if you only use it for personal reasons it's easy to see uh, low value or an informal way to, to communicate and talk or whatever other jargon you want to throw out that social media skeptics might use. Uh, and one thing I think you always hear from people is, well, you know, I'm not a big social media player. I just don't have anything to say. And they don't understand the power of using it for straight up listening. Uh, so, you know, do you think there's a way we can reshape the definition of social media from a playground to more of a donor intelligence tool. Mm -hmm. And, you know, can we use that, you know, to convince maybe the VP level individuals before even going to the gift officers, go to the person that, that kind of gives them their, their marching orders. And I know, uh, Jim, whatever true, this is, this is kind of something, um, you're dealing with right now in, in terms of uh, showing how social as a playground isn't necessarily the only way uh, that you can get donor intelligence. Yeah, I, I think there's been such a disconnect um, historically between uh, the, the, the fundraising teams and, and the teams that are, uh, that are doing running social media for, for the institution. Um, you know, there, there's there's a lot of playground kind of uh, postings that, that universities in particular post, and and some of that's fun and necessary and great. And I think um, as a as a VP who's looking at um, you know who, who, if they're if they're paying attention at all, don't really see much where or don't see as much where there could be value. Um, I, I'm working with a a very large Midwestern institution that is that is known uh, primarily uh, you know sort of to the public as an athletic uh, powerhouse um, they were uh, it, you know building a, a very large performing arts center and and fundraising for it and and looking at the challenge of, of building a very expensive performing arts center for this very large institution 
Um, and so we were, you know, trying to analyze some of their their Facebook posts uh, on performing arts to give them a sense of who was engaging with that content. And it turned out in the last nine or ten months, they didn't have a single post that had anything to do with performing arts. Um, <laughs> and so really unable to even understand uh, from that perspective who was engaging with them. And so I think moving forward as they're trying to find those prospects, you know, thinking about engaging more. But I think if if the folks who are doing social media um, and and the folks who are sort of fundraising for the institution's top priorities, uh, you know, if there's more communication there and more, uh, you know, obviously you can't turn it into a marketing tool for the development office, but uh, more of that sort of information on on the social platforms, I think, will help to convince people that there can be some real intelligence that we can uh, we can engage with those alums with. Yeah. So you're. You're talking about our always favorite topic of exploding silos. You know, we, as a social media community manager, I need to be more in touch with what fundraising priorities are currently happening at the major and principal gifts level, and then maybe I can float some content out there and see, see uh, which flies stick to the paper, so to speak. Uh, Mike, what's your take on this? Um, I think if again, like if we show um, if we show that there's more um, the the quality of of uh, prospects that are uh, that are on the different platforms, um, the the more we can con kind of convince the higher ups that it's worth being on there. Um, and I I do think that there is the perception still that we, if you're on social media in general, that you're always playing. Um, and which isn't the case because I mean, you know, people are more and more are getting their news on social media, um, and I don't think that's always playing. Um, so I think that that is just a perception that um, you know I, I wish that we could get rid of, um, and hopefully over time, um, the more it becomes ingrained in everything that we do um, and what we use, the more that um, that'll go away. But um, I do think that you know. As we kind of show um, some of the higher ups, it's hard concrete data um, about the the prospects that are online, um, you know, and all the different platforms. The more they'll they'll understand why it's important to use those platforms and either listen or engage or both um, with with prospects on there. So, uh, and that's something that I I worked on at at RPI and. I'm starting that process here at, at IC as well as kind of going through um, the what I did at RPI was go through our Twitter followers um, for the alumni account and literally find every single person in our database um, and figure out how many alumni are following us and then figure out how many of those were ranked prospects um, and you know out of the 680 some odd um, people that I found were, that were in our database, you know, over 125 were ranked prospects, and uh, the top 20 of those were um, major gift prospects. So that definitely opened a lot of eyes um, and created different perceptions um, and kind of killed old perceptions um, that helped kind of push that momentum forward a little bit. And only if there was a product that could help you streamline some of that, right, Jim? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I shameless, shameless plug on, on the host part there. Uh, well, that's a nice uh, that's a nice segue, Mike. Uh, it's, it's almost as if you had these questions ahead of time. Uh, <laughs> you know, I think uh, data is pretty big. Uh, you, know, you know, what are the what are the key metrics or examples you think we can show gift officers to re to really get them interested in social? Um, and where have you where have you seen success there? I know Mike, you just mentioned you know showing actual prospects that are on that are on Twitter is a big one. Is there anything um, you know? And I think the other thing people have to realize is paying attention to demographic data, right? I mean. You go to a conference, and a lot of people will tell you how young people are gravitating uh, from Facebook, as if to imply that maybe you need to start distancing yourself from a Facebook strategy. 
Uh, I think we would all disagree with that. But at the same time, the demographic that is increasing on Facebook is the 55 and over demographic. And this is, uh, you could argue, the, the prime major gift demographic that's starting to, uh, if they weren't there already, they're on Facebook now. Um, they've probably been there for about five years now, but um, we work a little bit slow in this business. Uh, so what do you think, Mike, you know, you talked about those examples, but what were the the real big KPIs that you think really were kind of digested by by your higher ups? Um, I mean, uh, you know, just I, I don't think that they I, I think that they just didn't understand um, the level of of you know alumni and, and prospects that we had following us on social and we're active on social, you know, and being able to, uh, th that kind of opened the door to being able to talk about, you know, following these people and, and seeing um, what they're talking about and trying to understand them a little bit better. Um, and the fact that there are a ton of people um, who were following us who have donated in the past um, and they're, were probably some who probably should have been ranked. So I think that um, having something like that really opened up a lot of doors um, and um, ideas that, that I think for them hadn't even been a possibility um, in the past. So I think that that really helped a lot in, in terms of showing you know what the value was of just starting to integrate social media in general, even in the smallest way, um, into some of the strategies that they had for the uh, the gift officers. Yeah, it seems like we have to, you know, something I've been talking about for a couple of years now, the whole idea of uh, dispelling the fallacy that wealth does not exist in social media. Uh, mm -hmm. So it sounds like what you're saying is matching social identities with their capacities and kind of throwing that up the flagpole and saying, look, here they are. Right. Uh, Jim, in, in your experience, now you're trying to show people how your product can connect dollar signs to social engagement and also how, how your product can be uh, kind of a discovery tool or, or a research tool. So, you know, when you meet with schools, what do you find it is that really kind of gets them to sit up in their chairs? Well, I think I think two things really. One is uh, on you know on the professional side of social media, particularly LinkedIn, um, really understanding how how broadly their constituents are on LinkedIn and and the ability to uh, you know really for the first time understand the professional. Uh, you know, uh, levels of, of their alums and and be able to connect those dots. Um, on, on the on the pure social media side, uh, you know, it's really interesting work we've done with some schools. Uh, you know, a, 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 on the middle of the pyramid uh, prospects, you know, it's 50 to 60 percent or more of their alums typically are on Facebook. Uh, but even at the even at the million dollar level, we're finding 30 to 35 percent of of you know, million-dollar rated prospects are on Facebook, and uh, some are engaging with the schools and some are not, but, but they're there. And I think it's really up to the schools to, uh, you, know, you know, to get them to engage with the institution. But uh, I think understanding how many of their prospects are on Facebook um, can begin to help, uh, you know, as Mike was saying, can, can begin to help the higher-level uh, VPs, et cetera, uh, to understand that maybe there is some real value there. And, you know, I think um, the once you start with that and you have that, you've opened that door um, kind of um, and opened their eyes to that, I think then you can have, start having the next conversation, which is showing, you know, all of the, the um, prospects who may not be high-dollar high prospects but are extremely active on social and can help you um, in other ways um, that may not be, again, high dollar, but um, maybe able to help spread the word, which could then, you know, in turn, um, turn into more gifts um, later on down the line from other people as well as from 
um, those people who are spreading the word. So I think that that just opens the the, the door to the next level of um, of um, you know engagement with some of the the prospects that um, that we have at, at both at all of our all of our institutions. Uh, Mike, to that point uh, exactly. Some of our customers, uh, I think, are really finding some success in looking at you know who's highly engaged with us on social media and is not giving at all um, as as kind of low hanging fruit for annual fund participation. Uh, you know, Union College uh, in New York, in particular, real success in saying, um, you know, gosh, you, you you engage with us in the last three weeks on on Facebook. Uh, your live on uh, let's focus on you and the student calling program or whatever to uh, you know the, the institutions uh, you know front of mind for some of these folks may be a great time to try to engage with them uh, on the annual fund. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I and I can speak to that firsthand. I've nominated people and they've come back as qualifying for major gifts. And then when you look those people up that qualified, you see a, a crazy majority of them did not make a gift in the most fisc in the most recent fiscal year and you're wondering how can somebody that has the capacity to give two hundred and fifty thousand dollars not at least uh, you know give a throwaway gift for lack of a better term of a hundred dollars or something like that to the annual fund uh, considering they're engaging in our online and social communities and all you can figure is that maybe they're not being spoken to in the right way. Uh, I want to take this a different direction. I think what we're, we've talked about a lot so far is prospect discovery and showing capacity within the social communities. What about the idea that social can be an incredible uh, stewardship tool and maybe even cultivation as well, even after uh, a gift has been made? Uh, I know there's one gift officer that I was talking to not too long ago where I emailed her and asked her if she saw that her prospect was tweeting about her her new puppies and maybe she should send the prospect you know like a Cornell dog toy or something like that I'm, I'm sure we make something like that or a a coat a, do, a Cornell dog coat I don't know if we make those but Cornell store, Cornell store if you're listening you should probably get on that that feels like it'd be a top <laughs> seller uh, but these are like just the real life things that you can sometimes only know about people if if you're following their activity on social and you can kind of follow up with them or just like I don't think we're talking about invasion of privacy privacy if someone tweets a picture of their dog and you say those are beautiful puppies you should bring them you know by Cornell sometime and take them for a stroll to the plantations or something like that you know so uh, do you think there's are, are are we missing a major opportunity there to just use this stuff as a way of promoting the people that we hope to solicit or have solicited, uh, and just creating this kind of virtual relationship with them? It's very quick, easy touch points, uh, but I think it means a lot. I mean, if I check into a hotel and they tweet back at me, "I hope you enjoy your stay," like. That means more to me than it probably should, honestly. But it, it, it is meaningful. So, uh, do you think there's there's an angle there to introduce social media uh, in that in, in that capacity? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think that um, social media is the perfect you know avenue between a phone call and an in person meeting. You know, it's it's day to day life. So. Um, I think we've we're starting to I think most of us have gotten away from the idea of you know when you follow someone you're being creepy by learning about them about from what they're posting um, you know when people are posting especially when they're posting um, openly I, I think that um, it's just a given that people are going to learn things about you um, and so to be able to use that in some ways I think um, it's just a, is a is a missed opportunity to not do it. So you know, little things like that, like you know, getting a a dog coat or or even a a dog collar or a um, something that's kind of or like a little chew toy would be fantastic. I think um, 
and being able to use social media in that in that regard to um, learn, I, I think, is one of the best ways to use it for a giving officer. And pe- we, you know, people do love to get acknowledged on social media, whether it be one to one, person to person, or you know, maybe there is something that they um, did or a picture that they took um, that even if it was retweeted from um, uh, a uh, a brand account from the school would give them a lot of joy. Um, so it could really go a long way in stewardship. So I, I think stewardship probably is one of the best ways that um, that social media can be used in the in the um, giving process um, and probably one of the ways that's used the most in the giving process. Yeah, no, some people might, you know, the dog example, some people might say, well, that, that feels a little creepy. And, you know, to that I would say this business, fundraising in general, has always been a little bit creepy, right? I right. mean, that's, that's what you do. You, you subscribe to magazines and huge war and peace sized books with real estate information and stock holdings and you figure out who the wealthy people are and if you know them. Uh, social just can expedite that process a little bit and by the right. way you can even deliver a little bit of value to that to that person as well so it's not just all take. Yeah um, and, and I think maybe it might be creepy if you have never talked to that person before um, and all of a sudden out of the blue you're sending them you know a, 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 a dog chew toy because you saw it on their on their social platform and maybe um, you know, I, I think that there needs to be a relationship at least started, um, but uh, I don't. Yeah, I don't see how that is anymore. Um, I don't see that that is really creepy. Other than you know, you, you, if you're talking to someone at a at an event and they tell you about their dog, that's to me the exact same thing as as seeing them post about it on their social media platform. So if yeah. you're listening, march into your VP's office tomorrow and say, I have a Dog chew toy strategy for you, and it's going to be beautiful. Uh, go ahead, Jim. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, you. I was going to say I think that um, you know certainly uh, to Mike's point, you wouldn't start a relationship with a prospect, uh, you know, saying, "Oh, I see you have a dog, and and here's a chew toy." But I think you know at, at the beginning of a of a uh, prospect relationship, you know, having some of that intelligence to know, okay, this person likes dogs. They they go to uh, Nantucket for the summer, and they they have three children uh, in in elementary school. Like you know, to be able to leave like oh you know look at that cute dog. Do you like dogs? Oh you do. Great. You know like like so we have to, a vet college. Yeah. All right. <laughs> uh, to inform that conversation, I think um, once that the relationship exists, you know, if you think about what people post most on social media. It's things that they're happy about or proud of, and I think for you to know that is is flattering to them. So to talk about their beautiful grandchildren, or I saw that, you know, boy, it looks like you guys had a great vacation. Uh, you know, you know I, I think people are flattered when you, when you know the things about them that they have chosen to make public. Um, it's, you know, we used, to, we used to make those relationships built on stuff that we found out without their knowledge. Um, now we're now we have the ability to find things out about them that you're sharing with us. So I think there's there's real value there. Yeah, I mean I think you could make the case analog was creepier <laughs> exactly. than what this is. Uh, so we have a question coming in, and the time to turn the spotlight to the audience. So if you again, if you have questions, please tweet them at us via the Higher Red Live hashtag. Uh, this comes from uh, the esteemed uh, Vanessa Theo Harris from Babson College. Uh, she says, if engaging with prospects on social media channels, have you seen more success with branded or personal accounts? Anybody want to tackle this one? You know, I, I can't, um, I don't have any tangible, um, you know, examples to give, but what I, what I will say was, is I think that um, in a strategy for um, a, uh, a prospect, I think, depending on you know what the prospect is or who the prospect is um, and what you, your goal is for the um, for the prospect, being able to work in a little of both. So, yeah, I, I think that you know it helps to have one-on-one personal um, 
engagement with the the prospect itself, uh, him or her, herself. But I also think that um, if you can work in the strategy where you have something um, about which is either like a write up about the the um, alumnus or alumna. Um, or even a retweet or a post of that person's photo um, and kind of giving them props for something that happened um, in their life that could really go to help advance some of the strategy that the, the giving officer has for that prospect. Um, so I think it's just another tool. But So I, I would definitely um, say, you know, using both um, should be um, implemented to create the success. Yeah, that maybe is a is a vote for why it would be great to have some senior, well-known, respected administrators on Twitter, or at least somebody managing their handle for them. Because if the mm -hmm. brand retweets you, but then the president of the university were to retweet you as well, uh, you get a little bit of personal there, but then you also get the, the brand recognition. Uh, Jim, are you about to chime in? Well, I was just going to say from the, from the perspective of the branded uh, account, it's amazing to me I spend... Uh, probably more time than than I should uh, looking at institutional <laughs> Facebook pages, um, and the number of times that we'll see someone comment uh, on a post on a university Facebook page and no one responds at all, um, right. and I think that's the risk of of a branded page is if it's not being monitored, um, you know, it's like it's like somebody sending the university a letter and not getting a response, mm -hmm. um, and so I think you know certainly. If I'm engaging with somebody on my personal uh, account, I'm gonna. I know I'm going to respond, and and if it's not being monitored on the on the institutional page, maybe hard to, uh, you know, harder to, to control that. So we have a follow-up question coming in from uh, Erica at Wellesley. Uh, we got a we got an all New England participation thing going here. <laughs> I don't know if that's. I don't know if that's ever true's influence or not, Jim. Everybody um, is still at the beach. <laughs> that's right. Nobody's, nobody's awake yet. And, uh, but she wants to know, is it harder to keep relationships if using personal uh, because of staff turnover? Uh, but the trade-off there is it might be less personal with branded. Is there, is there a risk if alumni or prospects develop a relationship with a person who then maybe leaves the university and whereas a, a branded account can obviously be, be handed down to whoever, whoever is staffing the social media. Yeah, I, th I think that's, um, that's one of the real challenges in an, institution, in, a, in a, an industry where there's such high turnover gift officers. Um, you know, that, that relationship that might develop on, um, uh, on Facebook or Twitter um, is the same challenge where I've built up a relationship as a gift officer with a prospect and then I move on to a, uh, a new position. So, um, you know, I, I think it, it is a real challenge, but but, it is, but there is greater personal engagement, I think, on a personal account. I think it, it can also be an opportunity to, you know, if, if there is turnover, be if, and if there is a, a personal relationship um, on social to be able to um, Kind of communicate that hey, I'm leaving um, this institution, but um, you know I'd like to introduce you to this coworker, um, whether it be over social media um, or in person. But at least you can kind of connect people on social media, um, you know, with each other. And so I think you know being able to use that personal relationship can actually be helpful um, in some ways because of that. Great. Yeah, I mean, I think to summarize, it seems like there's there's pros to both approaches, and uh, you don't need to be mutually exclusive with one or the other. So get it all out there. Uh, so we're we're coming up on time here, uh, but thank you everyone who participated in, in Twitter land and uh, to to Mike and uh, Jim. Uh, I guess just my last question to you both to, to bring this thing home is: so what is a reasonable expectation? Uh, for how much a seasoned MGO should be playing with, or just giving officer, or but we're, we've talked a lot about major gifts, so that's why I mentioned major gift officer should be playing with social. What's what's uh, should we just be thinking? Anything is good. Uh, baby steps. How much should we be pushing this thing? I always try to uh, just say you know start small because a lot of a lot of times you know 
Um, I think Twitter is probably the, the easiest and best place to start um, a uh, major gift officer. So, you know, starting small, just having them, even if they're not on Twitter, help them understand what Twitter is and, and how they can start listening to some of their prospects and, and help them understand, you know, the best ways to start using the pro- platform itself and then slowly build um, upon that over time. And, and I think it'll naturally just start to take hold um, as time goes on. Mm-hmm. And I would I would just say even even the, the maybe the easiest of, of social media, uh, LinkedIn, I, I did a white paper four or five months ago um, and looked at sort of the top thirty institutional uh, top thirty institutions with VPs for advancement and and half of those are are barely on LinkedIn if at all. Um, and so, you know, some some of our some of our senior folks in the in the industry aren't even on LinkedIn and uh, I think, at the very least, get off the, the webinar and go tell your VP to create a LinkedIn account if he's not already active on it. And make sure they include a profile picture. Otherwise, it's a dead giveaway. Yeah, that, absolutely. That they're not taking it seriously, and then then we all look bad. Uh, just also want to say, uh, give a shout-out to Kate Post from Chico State, who was confused by the notion of dogs needing coats, uh, because, like Jim, she is located in... Southern California. So yes, uh, actually, the the canines of the Northeast frequently need a little bit extra uh, <laughs> to help help fight the uh, the polar vortex that comes through. Uh, well, thank you so much both for being here. I think this was a great chat. Really got to the uh, at least scratched the surface of of how we can start to implement social more at, at this level of our advancement operation. I think it's really important. Uh, Clearly, uh, major gifts is a huge focus for pretty much every advancement operation. Uh, everybody wants participation, but I think big gifts get a lot of the attention and the focus and the resources. So, as social media community managers call you call us what what you will, uh, there's a lot of knowledge I think we can we can pass up there, and vice versa. I think there's a lot we can learn from each other. To Jim's point of of really knocking those walls down, I think that's a huge first step is just, you know, going into some of those offices and be like, what can what can we learn from one another to to do some fun things here? You know, pick your favorite gift officer and then try a pilot program with them of, of how you can help with their portfolio, something like that. I also want to plug coming up in nine minutes is the Case SMC uh, Tuesday afternoon chat. So jump from here to there and really just waste your work day uh, with hashtags and and, and uh, professional development, as they say. Uh, thank you again to our uh, our our sponsorship. Uh, let me make sure I. Uh, uh, thanks as always, yes, to iModules and M Stoner uh, for sponsoring Advancement Live and Higher Ed Live. Without them, none of this knowledge sharing is is possible. So thank you to those two sponsors. Thank you to Mike and to Jim. And tune into more shows this week, including Student Affairs and Marketing Live, right here in the Higher Ed Live universe. Thank you all, and we will see you soon.